So good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? I hope. Excellent. Can everyone see the slides? OK. So my name is James McNellis. I'm a member of the Visual C++ team at Microsoft. And I'm going to give an introduction to the C++ coroutines feature today. Um, just a few notes before we begin. So this feature is still in development. It's not yet standardized. Uh, it will not be part of C++ 17, but it is going to be part of a technical specification that should be done soon. Um, I'm here to describe the current proposal, not to argue about you know one particular design versus another, uh, though I'd be happy to do that outside you know, after the talk. So with that out of the way, um, just one brief thing. Uh, so our team, the Visual C++ team, is very interested in your feedback, in you know, learning a bit about uh, how you use C++. And so if you would like an opportunity to win an Xbox One S, um, we've got a survey here, and I'll have the link at the end of the talk as well. I've been told that I am not allowed to win it, so I want all of you to try and you know, have that opportunity. So to start off here, um, what's the motivation for this feature? So why add coroutines at all? Um, you know, a lot of effort has gone into adding this to the language, a lot of uh, design work. Um, I don't know if it's quite as much design work as went into the, um, um, the digit separators, but um, it, has been, it has been a substantial lot of work. So what do we gain from adding coroutines to the C++ language? And to demonstrate that, I'm going to uh, use an example that I've lifted from a presentation Gore gave here last year uh, from his talk. So here we have a, uh, a little synchronous function. In this function, we have, let's say, a TCP library. And it establishes a connection to a TCP server. And then in a loop, it reads 4K chunks from that connection until either it's read the number of bytes that were requested, or it uh, reaches the end of the stream. And then it returns how many bytes were remaining that it did not read. So this is a synchronous program. The call to TCP connect is going to block until it establishes the connection. And then each of those calls to read inside the loop is going to block until the read completes. And note that in reality, within that loop, we would actually be doing some data processing, which we've just um, omitted here for brevity. So since these operations may take a long time, we don't really want to block, right? We want to, take, we want to tell the machine, hey, go establish a TCP connection for us. And when it's ready, let us know so that we can continue with the program. And then, hey, go read four kilobytes of data from that stream. And when you have them, let us know so that we can use them and continue on. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to have to turn this into an asynchronous program. And to do that, we're going to have to make a few changes. So the first change is to the signature of the function. Uh, instead of returning an integer, we're going to have to return a future of, of the integer, because we're not going to have the value when our function returns. Next, we're going to have to wrap up all of our state into a little structure uh, so that we can pass it around between uh, the, the parts of the asynchronous operation. And because that, that state is going to outlive the frame of the function, we're going to have to dynamically allocate that on the heap. Then we're going to establish the connection. And we'll assume that our auth the author of our TCP library has very helpfully given us a nice asynchronous API to replace the synchronous one we were using before. And when the connection is established, we'll say, OK, call this continuation, and we'll use it. So then inside of that continuation, we're going to enter a loop, the same read loop that we had before. Uh, within there, we're going to actually go and do the reads. So each iteration in the loop, we're going to read from the connection. And then each time the, um, the TCP library has data for us, it's going to call us back and let us know the state that we have. Um, there's still a little bit of magic here. This do while function is not part of the standard library, but uh, we can implement it rather simply. So uh, how many people think this is just as simple and good as the uh, synchronous program? How many people would like to write code like this? How many people are stuck having to write code like this today? Yeah, OK, there we go. Um, so there's actually a bug in this slide. Uh, can, anyone s <laughs> can anyone see it? Yeah, Gore can see it. See, I, I can't call on Gore. Last year when he gave this talk, I raised my hand because I'm an idiot. Um, so if we look again at our synchronous program, uh, we've forgotten to return the result. So we just need to add uh, one little line of code here to return the result. Would anybody like to uh, guess where? Not you, Gore. Well, we just need one more continuation. And when we're done with this entire loop, uh, we will return the result in a ready future. 
So, uh, simple. Yeah, this is great. Uh, why are we doing this coroutines thing? <laughs> Not really. That's pretty horrible. So, um, our asynchronous code ended up being a lot like regular expressions. You may be able to write the code that does the right thing, though not entirely sure about that. Uh, and even if you do, it's going to be hard to maintain and modify, and even worse, to debug. So, what if? This is our synchronous program again with a little bit of white space added to it. What if we could write code that looks just like this, but actually has the behavior or similar behavior to that asynchronous program? And the answer is, with coroutines, we can. And so what do we need to do to make this program asynchronous? Here we go. Three changes. If you didn't see them, here they are in red. So we've had to change the return type of the function to a std future of integer, because again, we're not going to have the result when we return immediately. And then we've had to add this co-await keyword, and we're going to spend most of the rest of this talk explaining what that keyword does and how it works. So this program uh, now has effectively the same uh, behavior with respect to the asynchronous API that we had in the other asynchronous program. It's just an awful lot simpler. Um, so how many people think this is a little better than the, um, than the other example? Yeah, okay, that's basically everybody in the room. So let's uh, start with some basics. What is a coroutine? So a coroutine is a generalization of a subroutine. Well, okay. So what is a subroutine? A subroutine has two properties. So it's a thing that can be invoked by its caller, and it can return control back to its caller. So hopefully everyone is familiar with a particular type of uh, subroutine in C++. Uh, it's called a function. So you can call a function, and then when the function is done doing whatever it was doing, it's able to return control back to you uh, so that you can continue doing other work. A coroutine also has these properties, but it also has two other properties. It can suspend execution and return control back to you, and then your caller can resume you, and you will pick up where you left off. So with the C++ coroutine specification, both subroutines and coroutines are functions, and a function can be either a subroutine or a coroutine. So I put this little helpful table here, and you'll see um, we have the four different operations, and for subroutines, we only have two of those. We have, in order to invoke a subroutine, we make the function call. In order to return from the, the uh, subroutine, we either use a return statement or we just fall off the end of, a, of the function. For a coroutine, we invoke it exactly the same way. We just make the function call. We return using this special co-return statement, which we'll look at. And then we suspend execution using co-await. And we'll look a little bit later at how we, uh, how we resume. What makes a function a coroutine? So here we have a function declaration. How many people here thinks that, think that this function is a coroutine? Okay. How many think this is not a coroutine? Okay. So it may be or it may not be. Um, whether a function is a coroutine is an implementation detail of the function. So if you have a function today and you want to turn it into a coroutine, you can do so without breaking any of your callers. Uh, it has no effect on the function declaration at all. There may be some uh, return types that only make sense to use with coroutines, but std future is not one of those. So for, uh, for example, you can implement a function that returns std future either as a coroutine or as a subroutine. So what makes a function a coroutine? Well, a coroutine function, a function is a coroutine uh, if it contains a co-return statement, a co-await expression, a co-yield expression, or a range-based for loop that uses co-await. Or in short, a, a function is a coroutine if it does coroutine things, or if, it, if it's capable of suspending. So here uh, is that compute value function. Uh, I have two different definitions of it. The one on the left uh, is just a normal function. You can write this today in C++11. You can see that it calls std async to go and run you know, this very expensive task on a background thread and then return you a future that refers to it. And on the right, we have the same function implemented as a... Um, as a coroutine, and it uses this co-await to get the result, and then co-return to return the result. So what does this co-await actually do? Well, the compiler takes the co-await expression and it transforms it into a slightly different code. And this is the code that it ends up generating. So first it takes that expression and it stashes it in a, you know, a fake little variable uh, so that it can refer to it. 
And then it asks the thing, well, are you already ready? And it does this by calling the await ready function. And if the, th if the thing is already ready, if it already has the result that it needs, then it's not going to go through the, the expense of suspending. If it's not yet ready, then it's going to call this await suspend function, which allows you to customize the whatever happens right before you suspend. And then when that returns, you're going to reach uh, a suspend point, and it's going to suspend execution of that function and return controller back to the caller. Later, if and when the caller decides to resume you, you will pick up right where you left off right there, and you'll continue on with the program and get to the next line. It's going to call then this await resume function, which allows you to do two things. First, it allows you to cust you know, run some custom action when you've resumed. And second, it actually returns the value that is the result of that expression. So the result here is going to be the result of that call to await resume. So from this, we can see that in order to await on something, it has to provide three different functions, basically. It has to provide await ready, await suspend, and await resume. So let's look at a really complex uh, type that implements these. So this one is called suspend always, and it's part of the library support um, for coroutines. It's very simple. All it does is when you await this, it will suspend the function. And so you can see here, the await ready returns false, saying I don't have the value, so you need to suspend. And then we don't have to do anything on the await suspend and await resume. And here is a coroutine that uses this. So if you call my coroutine, it will print out, my coroutine is about to suspend. It will then co-await on this suspend always. And this will suspend the coroutine. It will, it will return control back to the caller. If and when the caller decides it wants to resume the coroutine, um, then the coroutine will pick off where it left off. And it will then print, my coroutine was resumed. There's another simple awaitable type called suspend never. And this one just does not suspend. So you can see, instead of returning false from await ready, we return true. And we can look at a program that uses this one too. So here, my coroutine, if you call it, it will print out my coroutine before the no op await. It will then await on the suspend never, which will not suspend, and the coroutine will just continue execution. And then it will print out my coroutine after the no op await. So here, um, the caller does not get the opportunity to resume the coroutine because it never actually suspends. So that's the first half. When a coroutine is executing, it uses this co await expression to suspend itself, potentially, and return control to the caller. So the other half is, how does the caller resume a coroutine? And to answer that, we have to look at um, how coroutines actually work under the covers. So what happens when you invoke a function? Well, when you invoke a function, the compiler has to construct a stack frame on the stack. And it, this includes space for all the arguments, local variables, the return value, temporary storage for any registers if it needs to spill registers onto the stack. Um, but all of this happens behind the scenes. You don't need to worry about this. Similarly, when you invoke a coroutine, the compiler has to construct a coroutine frame that contains space for all the formal parameters, the local variables, selected temporaries. Um, it also needs to have space, though, for the execution state for when it suspends. So when you suspend a coroutine, it has to store any state that it's going to need to restore uh, when you resume the coroutine. And it's also going to have to store the promise, which is the object that is used to uh, basically communicate between the coroutine and the caller. In general, the coroutine frame must be dynamically allocated. So the coroutine loses control of the stack uh, when it is suspended. So it returns to its caller, and the caller could call some other function and use any stack space that the coroutine might have wanted to use. Um, operator new is used by default. But this can be overloaded uh, for specific coroutines to allow uh, customization. Additionally, the compiler may be able to eliminate the dynamic allocation if it's able to determine, well, the coroutine is not going to escape from the caller's frame, and so I can allocate it on the stack. So the compiler is free to optimize there, and it will do that. And if you go to Gore's talk this afternoon, you will learn that it will do that aggressively. Finally, creation of this coroutine uh, frame occurs before the coroutine starts running. So it's just like creation of a stack frame, not something you have to worry about. It just happens there in the background. And what the compiler will do is it will return, and I put it in quotes because it doesn't actually return it in the sense of using a return statement. It will return a handle to this coroutine frame uh, to the caller of the coroutine. So what does this handle look like? Well, there's two types, or it's one type that's specialized. So the first is uh, a coroutine handle of void. 
And this has um, all of the basic uh, coroutine handle functionality, and it's used for coroutines that do not pass objects back to their callers, so kind of like a function that returns void. And then there's the coroutine handle for all of the other types of things that you might need to return. And this is derived from the coroutine handle of void. This is to provide simple interop, but it's also because it needs all of those operations, and it'll provide a few more things. So here's what the coroutine handle of void looks like. First, it's possible to have an empty coroutine handle that refers to no coroutine. And so the default constructor will give you one of those. You can construct it from a null putter. Uh, you can assign a null putter to a coroutine handle, and you know, then it has an empty state. And then there's an, uh, a conversion to bool that lets you test whether or not the coroutine handle is empty. Second, you can convert a coroutine handle uh, to a void star, and then convert a void star back into a coroutine handle. So this is to enable interop with, for example, C APIs. So there are many thread uh, APIs that allow you to pass in a function pointer that will be called, and then a context pointer. And so this allows you to convert to a void star that you can pass as that context pointer, and then on the other side, take that context pointer, convert it back to a, a coroutine handle so that you can invoke it. Third, the coroutine handle provides the ability to resume execution of the, of the coroutine. And so you can do this either by calling resume or by invoking this uh, function call operator. They do the same thing. Fourth, the coroutine handle provides the ability to destroy the coroutine explicitly before it uh, finishes executing. So this will, call all, this will cause all of its local variables to be destroyed as if a return statement was evaluated in the coroutine. And this happens at the point that the coroutine was last suspended. And we'll see some more detailed examples of that a little bit later. And finally, the coroutine handle provides the ability to test whether the coroutine has completed execution. And it's just called done. So then the other, speci so then the other the specialization of coroutine handle for all the other types uh, just adds two extra uh, pieces of functionality. First, it gives you the ability to get the promise back. And again, the promise is the thing that allows you to communicate between the coroutine and the caller. And second, given the promise, it allows you to get the coroutine handle for the coroutine uh, from which that promise, uh, to which that promise belongs. Since the promise is part of the coroutine frame that was allocated, the compiler knows how to generate this such that it gives you the correct coroutine handle address. Okay, that's enough of that. So let's build a really simple coroutine. So here is a coroutine, and it's got this uh, resumable thing, return type, and we're going to implement that. And Basically what this function does is it'll let you know, hello, I was called. And then within a loop, it's going to suspend each time through the loop. And each time it's resumed, it's just going to print out to tell you how many times the coroutine has been resumed. And here's a main function that uses it. And so we can see here, if we run this program, first the main function will print, well, I'm going to call this counter function. And then we call it, and the counter will let you know, okay, I was called. And the main will let you know, okay, I'm about to resume the coroutine. It resumes it once, and then twice. And then the main function will print out and just let you know, okay, I've reached the end, I'm done. So what do we have to do to implement this resumable thing? So the first thing we're going to need is we're going to need to define a promise type for it. And this is going to be that type that is used under the covers to um, communicate between the coroutine and the caller. Within the resumable thing, we're going to need to store the handle to the coroutine so that we can resume it. Its constructor is actually just going to take that, and we'll sh see how we construct that in a moment. And then in the destructor, we're going, to, we're going to call destroy, because again, in that function, we will never actually reach the end, so we're going to need to destroy it somewhere. We have a bit of boilerplate that we need to do. So here, you see we have the default, default constructor, and then we do not allow copying, but we do allow moving from one instance to another. Uh, the coroutine handle type doesn't provide any sort of lifetime management. It's just like a raw pointer. Um, that's exactly what you want so that you can build bigger abstractions on top of that, like this type here. So then we need to implement the promise type. And for this, we need to implement a few functions. The first function is get return object. And the compiler is going to generate code that calls this in order to convert the promise type into the resumable thing that we're actually going to return to our callers. And so here you can see, we construct a resumable thing, and we just call that coroutine handle from promise. We know I'm the promise for the coroutine, so get the handle that's equivalent to that. And we use that to construct the resumable thing, and then we return that. 
Second, we need to implement these initial suspend and final suspend functions. So these, and we'll see a uh, more detailed example in a moment, these allow you to determine whether or not the coroutine suspends before it starts executing and at the very end of the coroutine when it's uh, ready to destroy itself after returning. And finally, we don't actually return anything from this uh, coroutine. We don't need to return a value back to our callers. So we have to implement this return void function that just does nothing. So back to this example. So this is the coroutine. The compiler is going to go and generate um, a context structure for this coroutine. And so here you can see it, has, it contains the promise. It also contains our local variable i. And it's going to contain an instruction pointer or something that it, that it can use to, uh, when the coroutine is resumed, go and start uh, resume execution where it left off. Additionally, it may need to have storage for particular registers depending on how the compiler optimized the function. It may have other temporary variables it's introduced. And then the compiler is going to inject some code into our counter coroutine. So at the beginning of the function, or the coroutine, it's going to construct a new instance of that coroutine context using operator new. It's then going to get the return object, the resumable thing, and it's going to do that by calling get return object, and it's going to store it wherever the caller expects it to be. And then it's going to call that initial suspend function, and it's going to co-await on that. So if you told it, for example, if we used um, suspend always, that would cause us to uh, suspend immediately. If we use suspend never, then that means we'll just continue execution at that point. Then we'll enter the body of the coroutine and it will execute as normal. And then at the end of the function, it's going to inject this additional code. So here it has a final suspend label and we'll see where that's used in a little bit. It's then going to co-await on that final suspend. So again, this gives you the opportunity to suspend execution of the coroutine before it destroys itself. And then it's going to delete the context to clean up the resources. So this is not the only thing that we can use this resumable thing coroutine for. We could also create another coroutine that uses that very same type uh, that prints out a name along with the counter. So here, for example, we construct two of these counters named A and B, and then we resume them in an interleaved fashion. And the output of this function, you can see, it's going to construct uh, the, the A coroutine, it's then going to construct the B coroutine, and then it's going to resume each of them, and you can see that these are totally in parallel. There's no uh, interaction between the two of them, they're independent, uh, we can resume or destroy one of them without affecting the other one. So now we can fill in that last row of this table, and we can say that in order to resume a coroutine, we call the resume function on the coroutine handle. Are there any questions? Excellent. Yes, uh, so the question is, can you pass the resume to a different thread, or could you resume on a different thread? Yes, absolutely, and um, if you come, uh, Kenny Kerr and I are giving a talk this afternoon, and we're going to have a lot of examples that show how, um, how we do that, and a lot of the examples even fit on a single slide. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to resume a coroutine on a totally different thread. Yes? So the question is, um, inside of the coroutine frame, the compiler captures a lot of things that um, uh, basically you don't, you don't explicitly specify, like with a lambda, wh what you want it to capture. So it's going to capture basically all of the function state. Uh, and it's actually not going to need to move any of that because it's just going to construct it inside of the coroutine frame to begin with. Um, if there's any uh, parameters, uh, they, will need, they may need to be moved into the um, coroutine frame. Yes, but like all of the local variables, it's not going to first construct them on the stack and then construct the coroutine frame from those local variables. It's actually just going to put the local variables in the coroutine frame to begin with. So for example, you could have a non-copyable, non-movable local variable and that would just work. Yes? Can a class member function be a coroutine? Yes. Uh, yes, it would capture this and you, it would, be incumbent upon you to then manage the lifetime of the class instance also. Hmm? Yeah. 
Yes, I don't actually know if lambdas can be coroutines. Yes, absolutely, they can be coroutines. I just hadn't written one like that. Okay. One more. Yes, so the question is, um, given that you can destroy a coroutine at any time, uh, once it has sus uh, at any suspension point, does that mean that every co-await means you could have the stack unwound at that point? And the answer is yes, and we'll see an example of that. So that's a coroutine that doesn't actually return anything, but really we'd like to be able to return things from our coroutine. So here is our compute value from earlier. And this actually needs to return a value. It needs to return an integer through the future. So there's two interesting things about this, uh, this example. The first is, why is it co-return instead of return? And the second, and this kind of explains it, is, well, we're returning an int, and the return type is future of int. So you can't actually construct a future of int from an int. Um, and we're going to see how this works. So we've already seen that our promise type has to have a few things. It has to have this get return object. It has to provide an initial suspend and final suspend functions. Then it has to have a, um, for, uh, for coroutines that do not return values to their callers, it has to have a return void. For coroutines that do return values to their callers, you have to implement, instead of return void, a return value. So instead of looking at our compute value, we're actually just going to look at something a little simpler. So here is a uh, coroutine called get value. It's going to print something out, it's then going to suspend, and then when you resume it, it's just going to return the value 30. And here is a main function that calls that. And then inside of get value, of course, the compiler is going to generate that same boilerplate at the beginning and end that it did before. But what, so we, what we really want to look at is what does this co-return do? Well, given that we've implemented that return value function on the promise, the compiler is going to transform that into a call to return value to set the return value that you've given. And then it's going to go to the final suspend label, which will ask, is it, uh, should I suspend or not? And then if, you are going to, if you're not going to suspend, it'll delete the context. So we're going to make a few small changes to our resumable thing in, in order to support returning of the value. So this was our resumable thing from before. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually have to store the value inside of the promise. We're going to have to implement that return value function, which is actually just going to set the value. And then since we want to be able to call get from that main function in order to get the value back, we're going to actually, you know, from the coroutine handle that we have, get the promise, and then return the value prop, uh, member of it. So I do want to note these coroutines are all very low level because I'm trying to show the examples. Obviously, in like real library code, we would want much higher level abstractions. And we'll see, uh, we'll actually implement the coroutine support for future at the end of this talk. So those are the modifications that we need to make in order to support this. And so here, if we execute our program, we're in the main program and we say we're going to call get value. Get value is called, it, it says I've been called, and then it suspends. The main function will then resume get value. Get value will then say I've been resumed and it will co-return the 30. And then main will print that the value was 7,059,560. So, there we go. Any questions? Okay, uh, so what happened here? Well, um, we have to look at the coroutine lifetime. So a coroutine comes into existence when it's called. This is when the compiler creates the coroutine context, as we've seen. And then it's destroyed when either the final suspend is resumed or when you call destroy on the coroutine handle, whichever happens first. So if we look at our get value coroutine, you can see that in the final suspend uh, label, we call final suspend, and then when that resumes, we're just going to delete the context. Well, the final suspend of our coroutine type returns suspend never, so it's not going to suspend, it's just going to continue on. The context is going to be deleted, and now we're accessing freed memory, and so we don't get that 30 that we so nicely stored in our promise. So we have to make one small change here in order to um, make this work. Does anybody want to take a guess at what we have to do? Yes. 
So we just have to change the final suspend to say suspend always. And by doing that, when we're actually executing through the get value coroutine, we'll reach the final suspend label. We'll co-await on this final suspend. It will say suspend always, return control to the caller, and we will not delete the context. And so when we do that, it will print out the uh, correct result, unless you like the other result better, in which case, well, you can do that. So when does the uh, the resumable thing actually, or when does the coroutine actually get destroyed then? Have we just leaked it? And the answer is no, because in the destructor that we wrote a while ago, we actually check and say, if the coroutine was valid, then we're going to call destroy on it explicitly. And how does coroutine destruction work? Someone already uh, alluded to this before. So when you destroy a coroutine, um, it's basically as if you had returned from the last suspension point. So here, for example, if we imagine that we have a type that just prints out a message in its destructor, uh, inside of this re resumable thing, we construct two of them, and we have a suspension point between them. And in the, in the main function, we construct this resumable thing, we resume it, and then we uh, end up destroying the coroutine frame when the resumable thing is destroyed. And you can see here that first B gets destroyed, and then A gets destroyed, just as it would be if you were returning from the function. Now what happens if we don't get to the end of the coroutine, or we don't co-return from it? Well, if we just return the, um, if we eliminate the code that resumes the coroutine, then we also no longer construct B, so we never have to, we never actually destroy it. So just to recap, the coroutine is destroyed when the final suspend is resumed, or when you explicitly destroy it via destroy, whichever happens first. Um, and when the coroutine is destroyed, it cleans up its local variables, but only those that were initialized prior to the last suspension point. So are there any questions on that? Yes? Yes, so the question is, how do you um, handle the case where the coroutine is like sitting in the kernel waiting on something, some kind of event, uh, and you try to destroy it? Um, so then I would have to say that you've got a, a poorly designed coroutine type, right? You haven't properly encapsulated it. If you've given your caller the ability to explicitly resume or destroy you while you're actually you know, doing work, perhaps on another thread, then you just don't have a high enough level of abstraction. And so you wouldn't want to, like you can certainly write li a library that would get you into that state, um, but you wouldn't want to do that. So again, these coroutines that I, I'm showing, they're just, um, um, they're just very basic in order to show the, like how things work under the hood. Um, if you want to see some real examples, uh, our talk, uh, Kenny Kerr's talk, uh, my talk this afternoon will show a lot of examples. Uh, Gore may go into some details. Yes, one more. Yes, so the question is how do function arguments get stored in the coroutine frame? Um, they're stored uh, basically like member variables, and I believe they are moved into the, uh, yes, so if you pass a, uh, an argument into a function, it will be moved into the, uh, into the argument or copied if it's not movable. One more, yep. What happens if a coroutine throws an exception? Um, I'll actually save that uh, for when we implement uh, the coroutine support for std future because we actually show what happens there. All right, so just to recap, this is the same slide we saw before. So let's implement something that's actually useful. These coroutine types are not particularly um, useful. Again, they're just for exposition purposes. So let's look at that std future compute value again. And let's actually make this work. So let's pretend we've got a standard library that doesn't have coroutine support and we want to implement this. So we have to do two things. First, we have to make future a coroutine type so that we can actually have a coroutine that returns a future of int. And the second thing we have to do is we have to make future awaitable because std async is going to return a future and we need to await on it and be able to unwrap the value to get the, uh, the integer result. So let's look at that uh, first part, making future a coroutine type. So we'll have to open up std future and add a promise type to it. Or, if we don't want to do that, because perhaps we don't want to modify our standard library headers, um, there is a class template called coroutine traits that allows you to specialize uh, types without, you know, invasively modifying them. Uh, it's the primary template. It basically just gets that promise type from the type, but you can specialize it for your own types if you want to. 
So here, for example, we're going to write a specialization of this uh, for future of t and define the promise type in here. Inside of this promise type, we're going to store the actual promise, which is the, the sender side of the std future, if you will. Our get return object function is just going to call get future on that, which gets the future associated with that promise. Our initial suspend and final suspend are both going to be suspend never. Um, we don't actually need to keep the, the uh, coroutine alive in this case because the std future and std promise share a state that's not part of the coroutine frame. It's going to be some third object in memory. We have to implement return value. Um, and so for this, we actually just set the value on the promise. And then finally, if an exception happens in the coroutine, uh, we want to actually capture that exception into an exception putter and set it on the promise. And so in order to do that, we implement this set exception function on the promise. And when the, uh, when the compiler sees that you have one of these, it's basically going to wrap the coroutine inside of a try catch, and it's going to store the exception putter and pass it to the set exception function. So this allows you to marshal exceptions you know, to the appropriate context. So hopefully that answers the question that somebody had uh, a few minutes ago. So that gives us everything we need in order to have a function that returns a, a coroutine that returns a future of int. Now we need to actually make the future awaitable. So in order to do that, we're going to have to open up future again and add those three await ready, await suspend, and await resume functions. Or if we don't want to, you know, intrusively modify future, we can implement a separate type that will provide that functionality, and we can over overload operator co-await. Um, to take in the future of t and instead convert it into a future awaiter of t. And the compiler will await on that instead. So you can see here, uh, we just store a reference to the future of t inside of our awaiter, and then our operator co-await just uh, wraps up or stores, constructs a, uh, an instance of the future awaiter from that. To implement await ready, all we have to do is call uh, f.isready. When we suspend, what we're going to do is we're going to, going to call then, dot then on the future in order to schedule the continuation. So when the future is ready, uh, this continuation will be run. And it's at that point that we're actually going to run the coroutine, resume the coroutine in that context. So what this will do is when the future is actually ready, it will call the resume, it will resume the coroutine at that point. This may be on a different thread, it may be on the same thread. And then finally, we need to implement await resume that gives you the actual value back. And here we just call dot get on the future. Uh, there's a couple problems with this slide. The first is that std future doesn't have a dot is ready. And uh, the second is it also doesn't have a dot then. Um, so this isn't actually std future, this is std experimental future, which has these two functions on them. Um, so std future is not particularly good in its current form to use with coroutines. std experimental future is also not particularly good to use with coroutines. And if you want to know more about that, though, you'll have to come to Kenny's and my talk this afternoon where we implement a replacement and show why std future isn't so great. So that's all we need in order to implement, um, std, uh, in order to support coroutines with std future. Are there any questions about that? Yes. Right, so um, the coroutine handle is the, uh, the handle that represents the coroutine, so it, it, you know, it, it effectively refers to that coroutine frame. And so when you, call, um, when you call resume on it, it's just like using the function call operator. And what it does is it just resumes execution of the coroutine at the last point that it was suspended. So wherever the last co-await was, it'll resume on the next line. Yes, so the operator co-await here, basically, um, so std future does not have this await ready, await suspend, and await resume. So the operator co-await basically just lets you transform std future into something that does have those and provides the functionality that you need. Um, so in this case, we didn't want to modify std future. Uh, we wanted to provide this separate type, future awaiter, instead. And so the operator co-await basically just provides, basically just transforms the future into something that does, uh, that can be co-awaited on. Any more? All right. 
So I'm going to show one more feature of coroutines, and that's yielding. So what if um, we have a coroutine, and we want to be able to return values to our caller? So we don't want to return just one value. We want to be able to return a value and then allow the caller to resume you, and you can return another value. So why might this be useful? So here is a, a little generator function called integers, and it takes in a first and a last integer. And it's going to return uh, all of the integers in that range, one at a time, each time it's resumed. So here's a function that might use it. Here we have a function with a range-based for loop, and it just uh, has int, uh, you know, the variable x. And when we run this program, it's going to print out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, there's no, um, there's no magic here. Um, we could actually write this um, just as easily with a non-range for loop. So we, create, we construct a generator of int, and then we're just getting an, a, an iterator from it, which we'll show some of the implementation of. And we just call begin and end on it, and we iterate over it. So what that co yield does is it get, takes the promise, and it calls yield value on it, and then awaits on whatever it returns. So in our promise type, we're going to store a pointer to whatever the current element is. We could also store the current element, but we could imagine building generators of you know, some type other than int, where we not want to make a copy of it or move it. Our get return object is implemented the exact same way it's been in the past. Our initial and final suspend are going to suspend always. And the reason for this is, is we actually want to be explicitly resumed each time we want to get a value out of the generator. And then our yield value is implemented like so. We just take the integer in, we store it, a pointer to it, in our current, uh, local our, our current member variable, and then we return suspend always, so that each time that we yield a value, we suspend execution, and we return control back to the caller. So then we're going to have to have an iterator type for this uh, generator. We're going to have to Im implement begin and end functions. So in the begin, we're going to check and see, do we have a valid coroutine? And if we do, then we're going to resume it to get the first value. And then um, if we're done, if we've reached the end of the coroutine at that point, then we'll return the end iterator. The actual iterator itself just has to be a std iter a, um, an input iterator, because obviously we can't iterate multiple times with this single coroutine, because once we've moved on to the next value, there's no way for us to get back to that uh, previous state. Inside of the increment operator, we're just going to resume the coroutine and then again check if we're finished. And then when we dereference the iterator, we're actually just going to get that current value from the promise. And so that um, is that. So to summarize, and just look at this table again. So we've looked at the co-return statement, the co-await and co-yield expressions. Um, we've looked at how we resume coroutines using the uh, co uh, coroutine handle. We've looked at the coroutine control flow and how the compiler basically just transforms these co uh, statements and expressions into something slightly different. And the boilerplate that we generate. So these are some of the design principles that were laid out in uh, one of the original um, uh, coroutine papers that I believe Gore worked on, well, I'm sure Gore worked on. Um, so the first was that we wanted these to be scalable to billions of concurrent coroutines. So one of the, um, um, if you can imagine there's two different classes of coroutines. This, these are called stackless coroutines, so you always have to uh, suspend from within the coroutine itself. You can't call a function and then suspend from within that, uh, that callee. Um, the other kind would be stackful coroutines where you can actually suspend from within a callee so the advantage of stackless coroutines is that you don't have to actually allocate a whole stack or allocate a lot of memory for each of these. You really only need to allocate just whatever you need for that one coroutine frame. And this means that you can allocate a whole lot of these. So if you wanted to create you know, a million coroutines and submit them all to a thread pool for execution, you could do that and you're not going to run out of memory. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't you know, valid and great use cases for stackful coroutines. It's just, this is one of the benefits of this design. They're also efficient, so suspend and resume operations are comparable in cost to function call overhead. So um, additionally, because the compiler is generating all of the boilerplate for you, it actually has much more visibility into, uh, for example, um, what is exactly going on so that it can make better inlining decisions, potentially inline coroutines, potentially elide the heap allocation for the coroutine frame. 
They're open-ended, so we've shown here how we are able to pretty easily bind uh, std future to the coroutine functionality. Uh, and then we'll show later this afternoon some other types, some other uh, library types that we've been able to implement very easily with um, coroutines. So there's seamless interaction with existing facilities. And uh, finally, it's also usable in environments where exceptions are forbidden or not available. So for example, if you're a kernel developer and you want to use coroutines, that's also possible. We didn't look into how that works, um, but there's some other functionality that you can take advantage of to enable that to work. So here's just a couple references you might want to look at. Um, the first is a paper just describing the plan, and then um, the second is the wording uh, for coroutines, the current specification document. Um, so there are three talks on coroutines today. Uh, the first one you are sitting in right now, so thank you for coming. Um, then we're going to have a suspension point where we're all going to go and watch the uh, keynote. Uh, and then hopefully you will all resume, and uh, you'll go to Gore's talk this afternoon, which is also, I believe, in this room. Uh, C++ coroutines under the covers. And then after that, Kenny Kerr and I are going to talk about how we have put the coroutines feature to work with the Windows runtime. And while uh, our examples are going to be Windows specific, our goal is to show you know, largely how flexible the coroutine uh, feature is and how um, we've been able to use it in order to make uh, our library both more beautiful, easier to use, uh, and also more efficient. Um, and then finally, anyone who wanted that link to the survey, it's there. And with that, I've reached the end. I can't advance any further. So um, are there any questions? Yes? How, how granular should you put a weight in your code? Um, it, um, yeah, so you certainly, like if we're talking about asynchronous code, um, you don't ever want to you want to avoid blocking wherever you can. And so instead, you would want to await on, um, on those things that would block and then schedule a continuation so that you're, you know, when it's ready, instead of blocking, when it's ready, you'll be called. So you wouldn't want to do that because you're trying to make, right? There is a cost to the await. Much like, uh, you know, a credit process. Um, yeah, so the question is, uh, there is a cost to the await. So it, um, it depends. And so it would depend on the relative cost of, well, how long do I think I'm going to block for, right? Like if I, if I think I'm only going to block for a few nanoseconds, then maybe it's not worth, you know, going through the, the whole process of, of scheduling a continuation. Um, but in general, you would just want to, you know, I, I guess, you know, in most like application level um, asynchronous code, you'd probably want to just await on every asynchronous operation to avoid the blocking. And again, the, like, so the overhead, if you're not, you know, if you're not doing a context switch, right, you're not scheduling something to run on another thread on the thread pool, um, the overhead is, is equivalent to a function call. So for example, if you need to wait on a mutex and the mutex, you can just acquire it, you don't need to, um, well, mutex is a bad example. If you need to wait on an event, for example, and the event is already in the signal state, um, then you may not even need to switch to another context. It may just continue executing, in which case it may be more efficient. Yes? What happens if you issue an ordinary return statement from within a coroutine? I believe you get a compiler error. I, I don't think that's valid. Like you either have to have a subroutine-like functionality or you have to have coroutine things in the coroutine. Yeah. Yes, so couldn't we have made an ordinary return statement behave like a coroutine? Um, I actually don't know the reason for that. I know that in the original... Um, implementation that I used like a year and a half ago now, it was that way. And then uh, the community decided to make it, uh, you know, instead of just await and return, co-await and co-return. Um, I thought it was because they just like, you know, funny phrasing. Um, but Gore may have more details. Nope. He's, nope, he's got no more details. There we go. So the answer was that um, they thought that uh, just saying plain return would be confusing. And so they thought the co would help. <laughs> yes? Uh, 
Uh, we will not actually cover that in our later talk. It is described in the spec, and it's not particularly a difficult read. It's actually quite short. Uh, yeah, so the question was, are we going to discuss um, how you would overload operator new? Uh, and the answer is, we're not going to talk about it in the next session. It is described in the spec, and I would be happy to provide an example if you're interested in one. Um, it, it's not particularly difficult. How would return type deduction work with coroutines? Um, I expect it does not, um, just because you actually have to tell it what type, um, you know, so that it knows what type of promise to construct on the in the frame. Yep. Yes. Is there any support for a kind of placement new? Um, no, uh, because again, you don't actually construct it yourself. It's always the compiler, it's con or it's generating code that's going to construct the frame. So all you ever do is call a function. Um, yeah, so you can, um, one of the things I didn't go in here, into here is um, when you specialize the coroutine traits, um, you specialize it with a set of arguments. And so you could, for example, use a custom allocator uh, that would allocate it in a particular way. Yes, so we will we will be discussing. Um, uh, this is Kenny Kerr, who uh, I'm giving the next talk with this afternoon. Um, we will be discussing uh, how we optimize allocations, and specifically in the std future case, um, uh, with the std future example we showed, you actually end up with two different allocations. Uh, first, because the coroutine frame has to be allocated on the heap, and then because the shared state between the promise and the future has to be allocated on the heap separately. And so uh, we have several examples that show how we actually can allocate those together. Um, to eliminate some allocations. And in that case, the coroutine is actually more efficient. Yes? So the same thing in the example of the coroutine, how does that work with the Yeah, so the, the, the question is, because these coroutines are stackless, is it a... Um, is it a compiler error to make a function call from the coroutine? Uh, and the answer to that is no. And uh, so the coroutines we actually use to see out and you know with the um, the stream operators, and so those would be function calls. Uh, so what happens is is when you resume a coroutine, all of its state is still in the coroutine frame, but once it's resumed, it, it regains control of the stack, and so it can call whatever functions it likes, and it, it you know can use the stack for doing that. Um, you just can't. Uh, what it means by them being stackless is it means you can't resume from within one of those callees. So for example, if you've got a coroutine named f and it calls a function g, uh, you can't suspend from within g. g has to return and then f can suspend. So a stack full coroutine would let you potentially suspend from within g. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the question is, um, how common is the optimization going to be where the compiler is able to elide the uh, construction of the coroutine frame? So there are certain cases where it absolutely can't do that. And so, for example, asynchronous code, um, where it has no idea what the lifetime of the frame needs to be, is always going to require uh, allocation on the heap. Uh, but other cases, so for example, this generator type that we have here, uh, the compiler should be able to see well, the, uh, the coroutine never escapes from its caller's scope, right? Like it knows that that main function uses the coroutine and the coroutine is always destroyed before the main function returns. So I could just allocate it on the stack there. Um, as for how common one design pattern is versus the other, I mean, it would just depend on the patterns used. Um, but Gore will be going into a lot of details on that um, or some details on that. Yes. Yeah. So Gore's answer was, if the coroutine type implements RAII, and I suspect if the object does not escape out of the caller scope, 
um, then in that case, the compiler should be able to uh, perform the optimization. Uh, additionally, um, I forgot what the second point was. But anyway, yes, that was the key. So, yes. So, coroutines can call other coroutines? That's actually, like, a, could a coroutine use a generator? Yes. It's kind of like maybe with a stack of coroutines, you, the yielding from those. Yes, so a, a coroutine can call another coroutine, and we'll have some examples of that this afternoon. Um, in that case, so when I said that they're stackless, so each coroutine can always uh, suspend itself. Um, what you can't do is if you have a coroutine F that calls a coroutine G, like G cannot suspend F. G can suspend itself. It can't suspend its caller. So they can compose completely. Yes, yeah. And again, that goes back to um, when you see it, when you look at a function declaration, there's nothing that says it's a coroutine. It's, it's fully an implementation detail. Yeah, so the question is, um, when we ship this, uh, will we have tools that uh, enable developers to, you know, not make common errors? So, for example, resuming a coroutine twice, um, you know, from different scopes. Um, so, I guess to answer both of those questions, the first is, um, this is already shipping. So, if you have Visual Studio 2015, uh, the latest update is fully usable. All of the examples from here, barring any, you know, errors I introduced in PowerPoint, uh, should compile. Um, also, we are working on implementing it in Clang. Uh, with respect to like helping uh, programmers like maintain best practices, our expectation is that most programmers should not need to write these coroutine types, and that you know a few library developers effectively are going to build these uh, these coroutine adapters uh, for the libraries, and will do so in a way that you know with proper uh, proper abstractions such that it's safe to use. So, for example, the std future std promise uh, example here, um, you know the the way that those are designed is it's it's hard to use it incorrectly in a way where you would end up with a corrupt state like you described. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. One more. Uh, pardon? When will the Clang implementation be ready? <laughs> that, uh, I, I don't know. Um, you might want to ask Richard Smith that. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, please do come back for the other two talks.